everyone. Thanks for stopping by for this new webinar from Silver Hill Funding, the LinkedIn Blueprint for Mortgage Professionals, Seven Marketing Tips for Networking and Growth. Uh, your presenters today, I'm Zach North, the Marketing Director from Silver Hill Funding, and I'm here with Juan Barcelo, a Vice President National Sales Manager. Hey, Juan. Hey, Zach, what's happening? And uh, we'd like to thank everybody for joining us today as well. We're looking forward to this uh, great content here that Zach has put together. Thank you. So, for our agenda today, we're going to do a LinkedIn overview. We're going to talk about how to optimize your profile, the trick to discovering your target audience on LinkedIn, which is really important, content posting rules and best practices, and finally, we're going to talk about Silver Hill. So I think this would be really important because I think we all have LinkedIn profiles. We all know it's important to use LinkedIn, and we all have seen opportunity for getting new business through LinkedIn, but it's sometimes hard to know where to start. It could be daunting, and you're not really sure what's going to work or what's not going to work, and we all have a limited amount of time to be on LinkedIn in the first place. So hopefully this presentation goes through uh, some helpful tactics you can use right away to help your business. The first thing we're going to be talking about are some statistics that we found around the web that, that really show what the opportunity is for LinkedIn. First, LinkedIn has more than 500 million users and 40% of active users log on daily. That's important to note that not just there are so many people using LinkedIn, but people use LinkedIn every single day. Second, LinkedIn is the number one channel B2B marketers use to distribute content. That's really important too. So marketers are understanding that if they want their target audience to see their content, to learn about them, to, get, to inspire others, they need to put it on LinkedIn or else their audience won't see it. But if you look at the third stat, only 3 million users share content weekly. This means posting articles that you find on the web, sharing uh, posts from other people you're connected with LinkedIn. It's kind of crazy to think that out of over 500 million users, so few are sharing content, but that's actually a great thing for us because we have more of an opportunity for our content to get seen. And we're going to talk about that a lot more in a little bit. Then LinkedIn makes up more than 50% of all social traffic to B2B websites and blogs. That means that if you have a Facebook account, you have a Twitter account, you have Instagram, whatever, if you're wondering about where to put most of your time and effort, LinkedIn has to be the answer because that traffic is going to your website, and traffic to your website is huge, not just for you to get uh, more contact from people, but just for Google to rank your website higher, because the more visits you get to your page, the more important Google thinks your site is. So there's a ton of value in getting traffic to your site. This next uh, I think is crazy. Only one million users have published an article on LinkedIn. So think about it, over 500 million users only 1 million have ever actually put their own content on LinkedIn. Again, that's a fantastic opportunity for us because we're not fighting with a million different cat videos or whatever else you're going to see on Facebook. You're, you're, you're going to get your content seen because so few people are competing with you. Next up, 80% of B2B leads from LinkedIn versus 13% on Twitter and 7% from Facebook. So if you're wondering where your referral connections where your leads are going to come from when you do your social media marketing, it's going to come from LinkedIn. And uh, while Twitter and Facebook are important for getting your message across, uh, if you're looking about, if you're trying to decide where to spend your time, LinkedIn seems to be the answer based on the stats that we have here. Uh, next up, 79% of B2B marketers, uh, and that's business to business, um, see LinkedIn as a good source for generating leads. Finally, 65% of B2B companies have acquired a customer through LinkedIn. I think the general takeaway here is that you have a big opportunity to expand your LinkedIn presence and grow your business. One, because that's where your audience is, and two, because not many other people are going to be doing the tactics that we're talking about in today's presentation. So our first poll question, I really just want to see who's using LinkedIn. So. I'm going to launch it right now. And poll question number one is, do you have a LinkedIn profile? And 
Sorry. All right, well, I'm not sure if that's actually working right now. Hold to close. So we're that's weird. Um, okay, so we're gonna move we're gonna move on from that one. Uh, looks like the the poll wasn't really working on on our go to webinar there. Uh, so that's weird. So anyway, what holds us back? So assuming that most of us are using LinkedIn, uh, first of all, it's a lack of an overarching LinkedIn strategy. Uh, Second, it's an incomplete profile. And third, it's a disjointed content posting schedule. I think these are the reasons why we don't get as much out of LinkedIn as we could, uh, and we're going to tackle each of these separately. So uh, to answer that, I believe that if we look at LinkedIn in three separate ways uh, and have a sort of a three-pronged attack, we'll have a strong LinkedIn strategy model. So these three, just it's only three. Uh, one is profile optimization. Are you constantly doing everything you can to make yourself seen on LinkedIn, whether that's updating your, your job history, describing your title better, adding endorsements? Are you doing every, even improving your photo so it's not 15 years old or something like that? Are you doing everything you can for your profile? Two, networking and outreach. Are you using the most up-to-date tactics to find other people on LinkedIn are you changing, updating, optimizing the message you send when you contact people? Are you doing everything you can to get as much referral, lead, contact information you can out of LinkedIn? And third is content distribution. I think this one gets left behind, but we're going to talk about it. It's easier than it seems. And if you create a little uh, consistent, small schedule for yourself, you, I think you, you'd be surprised at the results you can get. So that's what we're going to cover today. These three areas of a LinkedIn strategy. First is optimizing your LinkedIn profile. So there are a couple basic problems uh, with most profiles, and Juan's is actually great. I'm using his as an example of what works. Thanks, Brad. And, and, and what's uh, wrong on the left. So <laughs> one of the most common problems with this, a LinkedIn profile is a lack of a photo. It might sound unusual to us, but a ton of people don't use a photo LinkedIn account, and it makes a big difference. That, those numbers I got were from LinkedIn themselves. LinkedIn profiles with photos get 21 times more views and 36 times more messages. And it's not hard to see why. If you've ever gotten a message from someone who didn't have a picture, it's hard to trust them, right? You think it might be fake or a robot or something. It's really easy to get a photo. You can have a friend uh, just take an iPhone photo. Those work great and update your profile. Two, you never wrote a profile summary. The profile summary LinkedIn says is the most important part of your profile, and yet many people just will not fill it out. The profile is essentially your bio, and I have the arrow pointing to it. So you can see under Juan Barcelo, there's a description of what it is he does, results-oriented, real estate finance professional, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and this is really important because people don't have time to uh, read your entire profile, they can get that information. Yeah, I would like to think that it's more of a uh, kind of like what you would put on your resume, right? At the top, uh, who you are, describes what you do. Um, so anybody who's ever written a resume, uh, you know, ideally, this is what you want to use as your as your profile. Some people get more poetic about things and they want to write about you know some more <laughs> personal stuff. I think with LinkedIn, uh, we all agree that we like to keep it professional and address, you know, basically who we are as a professional. I think that's totally right. So there's another aspect of that, which is number three. Your profile doesn't include keywords that helps you get seen. Now, if you notice what Juan has in his, in his profile are certain words that, that if someone were interested in, in connecting with someone in the real estate finance industry, someone who was interested in, meet, in meeting with people that are related to commercial mortgages, et cetera, they're going to get these words. They're going to search for these words, and LinkedIn's going to grab Juan's profile because he has those words right there under his name. So beyond the value of, of someone seeing the profile and reading it, 
This information is really important for LinkedIn because their algorithms are going to pull these words and they're going to make sure that Juan is found whenever someone's searching for these real estate finance professionals. It's right there in his bio. They're going to take that information. And number four, your headline, the section immediately below your name. So that can just be your title or it can be more. You can be more creative. That's where you can call yourself an expert. You can go above and beyond and again use keywords if you put yourself in the shoes of the of your target audience, think of the kind of person that they want to find on LinkedIn and make that work for who you are. Here's more information on the summary section. It's really your secret weapon. And I grabbed this one just from LinkedIn and I've underlined the parts where you can see that this person was thinking beyond just, oh, I need to fill out my summary. Why did I underline those areas? These are all keywords that you suspect the audience is going to search for. Marketing, human resources, recruiting, distribution, material supply, oil supply, scheduling. They put those terms in there so that when people search for that, they're trying to find people, this guy or woman's name is going to pop up first. That's, and then the box on the bottom, specialties. So look at those. Those are exactly the terms that you'd expect people to search for. So if you're trying to get noticed on LinkedIn, uh, think about the different things you do and word them in a way that will connect with how you think your audience speaks and writes. So best practices. Start with the bang. If you think about how LinkedIn works, you only see the first 300 characters and then there's a, click, a button to click to expand. So if you're going to put all the meat of your summary at the end, people are not going to see it unless they choose to see more. And people are distracted easily, you can't rely on that. So, <clears throat> so you have to put the most important information in the beginning. Two, use keywords, you mentioned this. Three, don't talk about what you do, talk about how you help. So instead of just list, listing bullet points, that seem kind of self-serving, write about how you help your audience. That way, when they look for you, they're seeing you as a solution provider. <laughs> Number four, break up your paragraphs for easier readability. Just one wall of text is very hard to read, especially on your phone. So then, we're talking about discovering your target audience on LinkedIn. This is how you search for people. For this, I'm using some slides from our good friend C. Ski Skwikowski that show how to search for people on LinkedIn beyond just trying to type in someone's name and, and trying to get lucky there. So you may be doing this. You may not be. Maybe you're not uh, using some of the, the little aspects we're going to talk about later. But um, I think this is really important, and, and it'll just take a second to go through to see how to search on LinkedIn. First, select searching for people. <coughs> Second, choose your location. Third, look for your connections. It's always best to look for first connections. Fourth, look for job title. So you can see people who are your connections, who have the title you're interested in. So this is this is all very important stuff because you know as mortgage brokers in the broker community, if you're working with small business owners or investors, you can target them by you know selecting uh, specific industries like automotive or restaurants, or you can you can even look at real estate, real estate investors. You can focus on locations, you know, different markets where you're more comfortable or where you want to expand to. So internally here with our account managers, I always ask them to do this so that they can become familiar with other brokers uh, and investors in the area where they cover, uh, you know, according to our marketing coverage. So very important, you can be very targeted in this approach. I also use second and third, um, you know, uh, contacts, because these are people that are connected to the people you're connected to, and so it kind of opens the net even wider as to how many people you can meet in a certain area. So all of these are very targeted, very important um, different strategies that you can use. Thanks, Juan. So here you can see by doing that search, 
he was able to get 565 results. And these are not random people. You know, they have some connection to you. You can see those shared connections. And these people, you have somewhat of an in with because you know the same people. So it's not a cold call. This is just one way to use the search tool with LinkedIn. And this is nothing special to pay extra for. You have the ability to do this now if you're not already. Also, note all the stuff that he has going on his LinkedIn. Oh, yeah, he's got a lot of stuff. <laughs> mine, a lot of action. I wish mine looked like that. Okay, anyway. Uh, bonus tips for finding prospects. So identify a LinkedIn connection you already work with. So this is someone that you know is good, that, and you'd like to meet more people like this connection. Look at who has endorsed them for skills. Typically, you're going to get an endorsement for someone you work with closely, and they're, pro and they're likely going to be in the same field. That could be someone that you wouldn't find in a search, but you'll get there. See who engages with their posts. If they post regularly and they get likes or other people share their posts, look at who's liking their posts. Chances are it's someone similar to them. And finally, the people also view section. That's on the right-hand side of your page. If people are searching for this person, they're likely searching for other people just like them, and they're going to show up too. And that might be the type of person you want to talk to. Two, everyone says this, but joining LinkedIn groups is really important. Uh, you get access to the members of the group who, if it's a group in your industry and in, in, in an area that you work with closely, you're going to like these people. Uh, and, and every group is different, but a lot of them like to share content, share posts, and through that content, you'll make even more connections. Three, personalize your connection request. Add a message and use the person's name. <coughs> when you send a request to connect with someone, you have the option to do nothing, but that's really not the most you can do uh, if you really wanted to connect with someone. Obviously, you can you can leave a message like, "Are you interested in X?" If so, you can offer something free. Maybe it's a white paper. Maybe it's nothing more than a rate sheet. Maybe it's uh, a, a recording of, of of a presentation you did. You're giving some giving something to them for free, and then ask permission to connect. When you've done that, people uh, get that feeling of reciprocity. You're much more likely to get a connection if you've given them something. So instead, next time you're trying to connect with someone who you'd really like to meet, don't just hit send. Add that little bit of personalization to it. I'm pretty sure you'd find much better success. So I think I'm going to move past poll questions because we weren't getting a lot of luck with them the first time. So moving on. Uh, content posting rules and best practices. This is the area that maybe you're not very active in, but we're going to see it's not that scary, and, and the benefit can be pretty good for you. Um, first, the content overview. And just as an aside, I'm seeing a question here. Are you going to provide a copy of these slides? Yes, we are. I'm going to be emailing this to everyone uh, tomorrow, so you, you will get this presentation. I know it's a lot to go through, so you can go through it at your own at your own pace. Uh, which I think would be helpful. So, remember, 500 million users, but only 1 million have published an article. This is actually a really good thing. It means you have a big opportunity to stand out and obtain more connections by publishing content regularly on LinkedIn. You're not competing with so many different people. So, because LinkedIn means they're saying 1 million total. So, think about our industry, way smaller number. Benefits of posting content on LinkedIn. You can build authority within your network. People see you as the expert because you're the one that's providing helpful content. Two, create opportunity for others to share your content and expand your reach. When people share your content, LinkedIn sees you as a, as a valuable person, and you'll get seen more in search. <coughs> Lastly, LinkedIn articles are indexed in Google searches. I actually didn't even know this, but what this means I found out is that when you publish content on LinkedIn, uh, Google will use that in other search results. So if you've provided helpful content in an article, something like that, someone searches for something similar on Google, they'll link straight to your LinkedIn article. So you may think, oh, I don't want to publish content on LinkedIn because I'd rather just put it on my blog, on my website. It, it works the same way. People are still going to see that you provided this content. And then they'll already be on LinkedIn. They could connect with you directly after reading it, which they couldn't do on your blog. So how to do this? 
at your home page, uh, LinkedIn's made it very easy. Uh, you can see start a post, you have that, those different icons, and have that little link right beneath that says write an article. So when you click on that, you'll get this screen, which they've made very open and, and blank. They do that for a reason, to make it seem very easy, because it is easy. So on that plus sign with a picture on top, you can add a graphic. Uh, and then beneath that, you can just put a headline. I'll say, oh, I'll discuss interest rates in your investor clients. It's kind of an interesting topic. And then you just type the content right there. And then on the top right corner, you see publish. Just click on that, and the article will be up on LinkedIn. It's that easy. The key, though, is distribution. A lot of people focus on writing content, which they should, and then publishing that content. But if you think at that point you're done, you're missing out on the most important part in today's world because we're so distracted. There's so many other things you could be doing, and so many other people are publishing content as well. Having a distribution strategy is the most important aspect. It sounds, it sounds like it shouldn't be the case, but it, it really is in, in, in today's world. So think about what happens after you click publish. What are you going to do so as many people as possible can see your content? One thing you can do, share a link to the post with your LinkedIn groups. That should be step one. Tell people, hey, I wrote this interesting piece. I hope, it's, I hope you like it. If you like it, please share it um, and, and, and see what happens. If you ask people to do something, they will do it. Uh, number two, add the link to your connection request. Thought you might want to check out this article, something like that. So the next time you connect with someone, not only are you giving them a chance to learn more about you, but you're presenting yourself as an authority in the field. So that person sees your connection, they might not know who you are, but they know you've written an article about something that they care about, and they see that, oh, this person must have some idea what they're talking about. And so you have that instant credibility, and that could help you get more accepted connection requests. And last thing, ask others at your company to share the post. If you work with a team, if you work at a big company, ask others to share your post. They'll do it, and LinkedIn doesn't need to see that many shares before they start pushing content up. Because as I told you, only a million people, either five or a million, are even doing this. So you know, fewer people are doing it in your industry, in your area. If you get a small enough group of people to share your post, that could boost it enough where it could start to go viral even. So a quick note, sharing news articles is an important tactic, but it's not the same as publishing your own content. Your content promotes you as an industry thought leader and a solution provider. Sharing, like sharing news articles is great and, and it is an important tactic, but your content is what's really going to move the needle here because you're the author, you're the authority, you're the expert, and you're going to see the benefit when people click on it. So general rules. Um, a lot of companies have done research on this. So best posting times. And again, you're going to get this presentation so you can keep this by you next time you're thinking about publishing content. 10 a.m. to 11 a.m on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So that kind of makes sense. People will check LinkedIn more in the morning, not so much at night or on the weekends. Long posts get shared most often. This might sound backwards. Because you may have thought, well, people have such short attention spans, um, anything above 100 words, no one's ever going to read. That's not true. Uh, they say between 1,700 and, and, and 2,000 words. So a long form article, if it's interesting and relevant to your audience, people will read. Third, how to and list posts get the most views on LinkedIn. So that means like five ways to do this, how to do that. People know exactly what those articles are about because the title clearly explains it and they're way more likely to click on it. Fourth, keep list posts to five to 10 points for max engagement. That means you're not gonna say like 15 ways to do this. Much easier to do a smaller number. And for some reason in the marketing world, they always say to use odd numbers. <laughs> I'm not sure why that is, but, they, but there's been a lot of research that doing seven points is uh, technically better than doing eight. I couldn't tell you why. Uh, last thing, cheap title short, 40 to 49 characters for better engagement. Not only is it easier to read, but like I told you earlier, LinkedIn is very, they're, they're very likely to, to minimize your content and have people click to expand it. And so if you're trying to get noticed, it's better to keep it short or else people might not read your whole title because they just can't see it. 
lastly, some, some other best practices. And these are just go beyond LinkedIn and just the publishing content in general. One is make your customer the hero of your content. If, you, if your article is just about the new product you launched, that will probably not be as interesting to anyone who's not closely tied to your company, even if the product is really cool. People want to learn about themselves. People want to read about ways that they can benefit from you. So you can talk about your product, but frame it in the way that it's a solution for, for your audience. Two, tell a compelling story, not just a list of your loan options. What does that mean? So if you're describing a new program that you're offering, a new loan program, a new option that wasn't available before, frame it in the form of a, of a case study. Tell a, tell a story about how a borrower was able to do this when they couldn't do it before. Show pictures. Make it real. Show, show the real loan amounts. Uh, the, talk about where the, this deal took place. These things matter because they make the story real, and it adds an emotional level that people can actually transact on. I think we have a good question right now, relevant to this. <coughs> and the question is, uh, are testimonials a good idea to post? I would say 100% yes, they are. Uh, the great thing about testimonial, it comes from someone else. You're not talking about you. Someone else is, is telling the story. Um, what I've, I, I've done a lot of research on testimonials. People say that the first thing, of course, you have to do is get permission. But if you can use the person's full name, it goes way farther. Uh, sometimes you just can't do it because you're not allowed to. But when you say, like, oh, I, I had the best experience with this person and it's signed by bar or, you know, referral partner, it just doesn't sound as real. And, e and even though people will never know, like, the, that person, if you give their name, they're not going to know who that person is. The fact that it, it is a real person goes a lot farther. So if at all possible, you're getting a, a testimonial, ask permission written is always best. If you can use the person's name, even if it's just the first name, like, you know, Sharon, Tim, that goes a lot farther than borrower. So that's a great question. Uh, lastly, end your posts with a question. Uh, inspire readers to engage with you. So if you finish your post with something like, hey, have you experienced something similar? Like, can you tell me a time that you had this sort of problem? You invite people to leave a comment and you're creating a conversation. Not only is it good because you can get to talk to people and maybe build connections, but LinkedIn will boost posts that have a lot of engagement. So if you have a lot of back and forth, you're responding to their comments, other people are adding to the discussion, LinkedIn algorithm says, oh, this is a popular post. We'd better move this up and make this more readily vis visible for everyone else. So it has a lot of benefits. Last thing we're, we're going to talk about here on LinkedIn is the X factor in 2019, and that's LinkedIn video. Video scares people uh, for obvious reasons, <laughs> but it really doesn't have to be so scary. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't need a, 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 you know, a professional production team to make videos. LinkedIn says that LinkedIn videos get three times more engagement than text posts. 84% of buyers report they had been convinced to buy after watching a brand's video. So what they're really talking about here, and maybe you've seen this on your LinkedIn profile already, it's just filming yourself talking is, is, is what works best. Um, putting yourself in front of a blank background, using a, a camera phone, and just having a conversation works really well with people. They see your face. They see you talking. Uh, it's much different than just pub publishing text on the page. Again, tell a story. You know, video works well with testimonials if you can have the person there with you. If you can, if you're at the location, things like that, uh, you're adding this visual story element that, that creates an emotional connection with your audience. Uh, so yeah, interview a colleague, a brief back and forth can be informative and entertaining. So maybe it's someone else at your company. Maybe it's a, someone who works in a different department. Maybe you have insight with this person and it's more interesting than just talking to a camera if you have back and forth with someone else there. Or maybe you want to peel back the curtain Show where you work, how you work. Uh, again, this is about creating that personal connection with your audience. so They can get to know who you are and feel more comfortable working with you, especially if they're someone that you haven't already connected with and they don't know you yet. Five, this is the last one. At a conference or a trade show, uh, let your network know via video. 
I'm seeing, I, I just actually came back from a social media conference in San Diego. Every five feet, someone was literally getting, like, tripping over someone else because they're recording a video of themselves, just talking about a session they just attended, talking about what the schedule was like, something they learned. Uh, next time you're at, like, a mortgage conference, a trade show, just setting up a quick video at the event saying, hey, I'm here. I'm really excited about this. We're learning this. We're at Booth X. These kind of videos matter to people, not just because it shows that you're active, but it allows them to connect with you if they're at the same place. And there's only so many of these events going on. You're likely to make a connection based on the video you create. Okay, so moving on here, just to quickly review. These are the three aspects, the profile optimization, networking and outreach, and then content distribution. If you focus on these three areas, you will have a strong LinkedIn strategy. And, and I think from what we've gone on about today, these are not things that, that will take a year to implement. You can really start right now. If you have a blog on your website and you publish content semi-regularly, just think about putting your next blog on LinkedIn instead of your website and seeing what happens. Next time you try to connect with someone, which you might do every single day, try to customize that connection message. Try to provide something of value to them for free and see if that helps you make more connections throughout the day. So that's really what I want to talk about with you today. Uh, I really hope this helps. I'm sure we all use LinkedIn. We'd like to use it better. Uh, so I think this should all help, and, and, I, and I hope it has been helpful. Uh, so we got a couple of questions here before we move on with our uh, – with our product stuff. Um, someone asked about a recording. We will be posting these recordings. Uh, when will we be posting these? I'm gonna send you this recording in an email tomorrow, but it's also always gonna be available on our YouTube channel and on our website. Um, yeah, and, and there's there's been a, a couple of people that have included uh, some of the things that they do from official press releases of, of their closings, to even commercials that they can play in local television. So, you know, thanks for, for including those for, for the benefit of, the, for, of everyone um, attending. And, and those are great strategies as well if you can carry them out. Um, certainly any way of getting your, your name and your company and what you do out there is great. So uh, we're going to move on into our uh, – so, again, thanks for joining us so far. We're going to move on into our own solutions that we provide as far as commercial loans are concerned. Okay, um, so we, we, we always try to leave you with a little bit of what we do um, after providing some great content uh, and some strategies where you can employ it in your own business. So let's talk a little bit about some solutions and we'll go quickly through these. You know, Silver Hill Funding, we are basically an alternative lending solution to, uh, to you know, to bank type fallout loans, loans that are near miss at the bank. Um, these can be either real estate investors or small business owners. Um, this is our focus, um, and this is the space we're in. We like to think that we are, you know, positioned in between the banks and then the hard money or private money lenders that exist out there. Um, so let's continue. So these are all good examples of when it makes sense um, to come to Silver Hill with a loan. So, you know, Cash out equity from existing commercial property, you know, that is a, probably about half of our pipeline. So most of the loans we do, a little bit more than half really, uh, are cash out. These are folks that are coming to us that they either have uh, real estate investments or their own commercial property that they run their business out of, and they're looking for money. They're looking to use that money for reinvestment in the business or another real estate or working capital, inventory, uh, covering payroll. It could be any one of those different reasons. So that's one of the main reasons people come to us uh, for a loan. Uh, you know, I mentioned borrowers who are just missed at, at a bank, uh, who are, you know, credit is good enough, uh, the, the company is good enough, the revenue is there, but for one reason or the other, it just doesn't fit with what the banks are looking for. Um, we see also a lot of people coming off of a high rate short-term bridge financing. Maybe they brought the they bought the property using a private loan or hard money bridge loan uh, to get in. They fixed it up, um, and they're ready, they're ready to rent it out and keep it for the long term. So that's another reason why 
folks come to us. Um, you know, the typical person that in business cannot show a lot of income on their tax returns. We have some great solutions for light dock and, and no tax return programs that people like. I mentioned earlier stabilization of properties. So any properties that have been recently stabilized, rehabbed, or occupied, those are also good for us. The difference there is that with most, most banks and community lenders, they like for the property to be stabilized for at least 24 months. Um, finally, seasoning on title and out-of-state investors. These are also typical uh, requirements or restrictions that you will see most common uh, with a bank offer. So what we do, our sweet spot is really 250000 to $2 million commercial real estate loans, what is called the small balance commercial loan space. Um, you know, rates as low as 6375 You know, we do amortizations up to 30 years, which is a great sell when you're talking about, you know, competing with a bank. Most banks are at 20 to 25 years. When you do a 30-year mortgage on a commercial loan, it makes your cash flow better because your payments are lower month to month. Again, cash out is a big deal, um, and, and we are doing <clears throat> something newer to the commercial market, which is a 30-year fixed loan. So people are used to a 30-year fixed loan on the residential side, you know, for their homes or second homes or even in some investment property. We are now doing these on small balance commercial loans. So it, it's been a big hit, um, very popular, and a lot of lenders, a lot of brokers, borrowers really like you know that offer because you know you can you can not you know stop worrying about refinancing and repositioning your debt for the rest of the life of the loan. Minimum credit scores we look at 650 or higher credit score. Obviously we prefer higher credit the better, but we will definitely help folks down to 650. Prepayment penalties we have three different options. Uh, I'd like to caution you that these are very common when you're talking about commercial loans. They are not very common in the residential world. Um, eligible markets, we do like to stick to the top 200 MSAs, more urban areas where commercial property are more uh, marketable, more dense, and there's obviously a, a, a bigger uh, need or desire for them from the investor market. Eligible borrowers, we do lend to citizens of the United States, permanent resident aliens, or any legal entities, excluding trust and not-for-profit companies. Uh, very importantly, you know, and unfortunately, we always like to push for this, but the, the unfortunate part is foreign nationals are not eligible for us. And we understand that there are a lot of markets where foreign nationals are investing in property. Unfortunately for us, we cannot provide financing for foreign nationals at this point. So what kind of properties do we do? Your typical apartment building, five plus units, uh, multifamily and your mixed use. And then we also do a variety of commercial property from retail office and warehouse to self storage, daycares, restaurant, automotive, light industrial, and mobile home parks. We look at all of these property types, preferably in more urbanized areas. Uh, we like to stay away from more rural areas. So that's you know a, a good variety, a good mix of commercial property types in the small bound space. Um, let's look at what we don't do. So we do we do a good variety, but there are things that we just can't do. Property types we just can't entertain. So these are it basically raw land uh, and farm properties or agricultural properties are ineligible for us. Uh, we don't do new construction or properties that need significant rehab and remodel. Uh, typically, we're okay with some light rehab, light remodeling, uh, but anything that's extensive and or new construction, we will stay away from. Um, environmentally sensitive properties, you know, gas stations, dry cleaners, or any other properties that have had, you know, heavy manufacturing that's considered dirty, uh, for the environment uh, with regards to byproduct or any other kind of chemicals that are used, we will stay away from those. Churches, your traditional church uh, properties, we will not do. Church tenants, we are okay with as long as the property is a commercial property. Adult entertainment, we, uh, we don't do strip clubs. Uh, we have been able to do some adult retail stores, uh, consider them as retail, so we can take a look at those. 
One that is uh, a very prominent these days, uh, a lot of questions are asked, is cannabis-related property. You know, there are many states now where cannabis is legal, and those business activities basically are, are carried on as, as if they are eligible. <laughs> the, the problem is, for most lenders, um, the, federally speaking, the uh, anti-money laundering laws still prevent uh, most lenders in the country, and even local banks, from lending uh, to any type of property where there is any kind of cannabis-related pro- uh, activity going on. So even if you have a strip a strip center, for example, um, with you know ten units and it's retail and office and all that, if only one of the tenants is cannabis related, then um, it becomes a problem. And it's a problem not only for us but for most lenders these days. Until the federal rules change, um, you know it, it's going to be very difficult for properties with these kind of tenants to um, to to you know basically get financed. Um, special use properties, marinas, ice skating rinks, golf courses, bowling alleys, movie theaters, you know, those are all special use property types that we will not lend on. I'll, I'll answer a few questions here related to property types. Um, have a 40 unit multifamily, yes, we can do those. Uh, another question, what about legal CBD stores? At this point, our position is still the same. We have not, um, Changed our our position on CBD, um, which is I, I understand more medicinal than anything else. Um, but at this point, we're still not changing our rules on that. Okay, moving on to broker compensation. This is a good topic for all you brokers on the line. I'm sure everybody's you know certainly concerned about how much I can make if I do deals with Silver Hill. So you can make five points, uh, you know, up to three in origination and up to two points in yield spread. We have the lowest uh, yield, spread, yield spread adjustment to rate uh, in our space. Most other lenders uh, charge uh, half a point in rate and pricing for only one point of, of yield spread. So we charge 0.375. Um, <clears throat> now, is it realistic to make five points on every deal? Certainly it's not. The average is usually between two and three. You know, the good thing is Silver Hill does not charge points. We only have closing fees associated with transactions. So the good thing is that you, the broker, can make the bulk of the compensation on any deals that you will send to us. So we're going to talk about three different solutions that we have. Our lowest rate solution, which we call our full doc or complete. Um, with tax returns, we can get our lowest available rates. And you see there the rates starting at, in the low sixes to mid sixes. You know, this is typically for that, you know, that near miss at the bank, the person who has the, the high FICO, who can verify their income, who, you know, for some reason or the other, just the loan did not work at the bank, stabilization, or any, you know, debt service requirement at the bank was too high. Any one of these reasons, this is the best fit, our lowest rate solution. And on average, these rates are, you know, typically under seven, uh, and that's even including loan level adjustments and yield spread in many cases. So, you know, we're very FICO and LTV driven, so that's what really drives pricing for us. Light dock solutions, we talked about those individuals that, you know, they can't verify a lot of income on their tax returns or they just, you know, really don't want to even want to get into uh, delivering tax returns to a lender, um, you know, we have solutions for those folks as well. You know, rates tend to be a little bit higher, but again, it's adjusted for the risk of lower due diligence with regards to, you know, income um, and uh, verification of rents and all these other items that, you know, are more typical to a uh, full doc loan. Finally, the one to four program, which we like to call the Plex program here. We're doing, uh, you know, between one to four unit residential investment properties. These must be closed in a business entity name. It is a very popular investment nowadays for real estate investors that are looking at commercial property. A lot of folks buying up, you know, bulk, bulk 
projects. They're buying up duplexes, triplexes. They are fixing them up. They're holding them for long-term rentals uh, as a long-term investment. And so this is a very popular program. And our debt service coverage is down to 1.0 on these. So very aggressive on them. There are a lot of lenders out there that are doing this stuff. And we do a, a fair amount of it as well. Uh, a lot of our brokers who see small balance commercial loans also see these real estate investment properties as well. So we're going to show you a few closings here that we've done recently. Um, you know, this one's in Texas. I want to focus your attention on what our fees are and what the broker made, uh, and, and, and as well, what solution we provided. So the issue here was a business owner in Texas wanted to cash out of their office property, but they couldn't get approved for refinance because of tax return issues. So there may have been something in their tax returns that prevented them from getting a loan at a bank. We were able to do them under our light dock program, and the broker was able to make a pretty good payday, $37,500 uh, broker fee, just on one loan. Here's one in Pennsylvania um, that we did. The issue here was owner of a restaurant was coming off a hard money loan, which we talked about before. We see a lot of this and wanted a lower rate, longer term solution, a nice payday for the broker, twelve six. Uh, you know, just for doing restaurant and restaurant loans are real hard to place. Uh, they don't always, um, are, they're not always attractive to other lenders and banks. You know, restaurants are a risky business in general, uh, but we do a fair amount of them and we do a fair amount of automotive properties as well. Here's one in Richmond, Virginia, uh, cash out refinance. Um, this is not, not a high broker payout. But nonetheless, it was a business owner that wanted to execute a cash out, but they could not provide tax return documentation to traditional lenders. You know, banks typically, they don't lend, uh, you know, do cash outs, but when they do, uh, it's very, very minimal, and it's usually to be reinvested in the business. Uh, in this case, you know, you have someone who wants cash out, but has a problem, you know, even providing tax returns. So we were able to solve that problem for them. I think our poll questions are broken today. So we'll just go move on. There's a few other questions here, and uh, if we have some time here at the end, I will address them. Okay, so just sit tight. <clears throat> so if you have a similar deal, you know, if you've done these deals recently, you know, our process is pretty simple. We like to see, you know, an application and one of our forms completed. We want to look at a, a tri-merge credit report. And this is a traditional mortgage tri-merge with three scores. We do look at the middle score, higher of the two of the middle score, so that's a good thing. We want to see a rent roll for multi-tenanted properties. If it's a mixed use or multifamily with uh, five plus units, we're definitely going to want to understand, you know, what the occupancy is, who are the tenants, and what do they pay. Um, operating statements for the property, we do like to understand what the expenses are and the income is for that property, so that's very important to us as well. On the front end, to understand if we have a deal. If you have an owner-occupied loan request, we'll either take last two years of tax returns or last 12 months of bank statements. We have an excellent bank statement program that basically you know, substitutes 12 months of business bank statements instead of two years of tax returns. And they're priced relatively close to each other, so it's not much of a difference. And finally, if it's a contract, a purchase, we do need a contract. We don't do uh, pre-approval, so we want to know that we have a real deal going. So finally, before we move on, I just want to talk about our Alliance program. This provides free income for you guys. So the Alliance program is free money, basically for doing more than two units of business with us in a given month. We are going to revamp this program going forward. It's going to make it even more uh, possible to earn extra income without upselling the rate. So a lot more good stuff to come. This is free money, guys, and something that everybody really likes. We usually pay out every month about twelve to fifteen thousand dollars in additional, uh, you know, fees to brokers only for closing multiple loans with us every month. Again, we just started with our thirty-year fixed products, so it's very important that you reach out. You know, again, 
If you want to sell a solution to a borrower that they never have to worry about closing costs again, they don't have to worry about market fluctuations and in interest rates, they don't have to refinance ever again on their commercial property, this is the product for them. So give us a call. Finally, we do have a very robust website that Zach runs, and we do have a lot of resources there. We have a pricing uh, calculator on there. We have social media tune-up guide, and we have some other important information, marketing toolkits, and other resources that you could use when you market for business within your own business strategy. So if you have some time, go in there, spend some time in there, register. One of our uh, uh, re re regional managers is going to get out to you and you know, kind of ask more questions about what you need. Um, and we're more than happy to help with any of your marketing uh, strategies or any resources that you may need going forward. One of the lowest, you know, if not the lowest deposit requirements in the industry is what, is what we have, which is 500 bucks. So you can basically get a commercial deal, which is otherwise very complex, started for $500. Most of the lenders that you go to will ask you for the full amount of the appraisal fee, which is typically two to three thousand dollars, or even more, to pay them their points on the front end before they've even given you an approval. So we just start with a five hundred dollar deposit. So again, if you have any small balance deals, commercial deals, anything here that made sense to you that you see that you think you have some opportunity with, go ahead and give us a call. You can either call me or Zach or, or send us an email. And uh, we'll answer your questions. We'll get the right regional manager out in touch with you. And, uh, and we'll go from there. Okay? So, folks, thanks a lot again for joining us. Um, we've run out of time today. So, you know, some of these questions, we'll have, uh, I'll definitely have a regional manager reach out to you folks with questions here. Um, but we've run out of time in our uh, go-to meeting. Zach, thanks a lot. Great job today. Great content. Uh, and if you have any questions, again, please get out to us. Have a nice day. Bye, everyone.